Good morning. It occurred to me that I believe an analogy for healing is something like, well, in my case, witnessing, or in a lot of women's cases here, experiencing pregnancy. Right? Because at the end of it, you're always like, oh, yes, I, I get a new baby. And, and through the healing journey, like, yes, I get a new life. I get a new chance at, at living, right? But in order for that to take place, there's always a nine-month period where something needs to grow first before that's even an option. And a lot of times we look for the, the instant gratification, but that just simply isn't the case. And we feel like, well, have I not prayed hard enough? Have I not done enough myself? Have I, have I not been good enough that God hasn't heard my prayers? Why isn't he answering? Because sometimes it is an absolute process that nobody wants to go through. And sometimes, even at the end of that waiting, when we feel like we can't wait anymore, there is a moment that is so difficult that had we actually known what it felt like, we wouldn't even have started the healing journey in the first place. I'm pretty sure that if Melody had known, I mean, she did it the second time, so I mean, thank God that there's that forgetful hormone in the female's body that helps you forget the pain and just kind of has the euphoric joy of giving childbirth. There's something about that pain, though, that absolute anguish when you tell yourself, I can't do it anymore, and everyone around says, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Just push a little harder. Just push through and pull through a little longer. And all of a sudden, it's over. When you think it couldn't ever be. And there is a gift. There's a blessing. There's something you couldn't even comprehend. There's that new life. I think that really is the truth in a lot of our existences and our cases. And I speak for myself. First and foremost, the first piece of scripture I want to start off with this morning comes from Isaiah 64. But have you ever had a situation that maybe you felt like, if only I had done more, or maybe I could do something better? I want to evaporate that this morning as best I can. This is what Isaiah 64, 6 says, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. First of all, it's a completely inclusive statement. He's talking to people who already are on the inside of knowing God, which is us. He says, our best efforts on our best day are not good enough. But that's okay. It's this reality check to remember that you need to remind yourself and be reminded of by people around you that when you are suffering and when you feel stuck and you have nothing left to give, that's okay because God is finally allowed to start being in charge when we start giving up on trying to take control See, and what the scriptures actually say here is kind of a really hard reality of truth that all of us have become like one who is unclean. Remember, this is a Jewish culture that if you were unclean, you were out, you were undeserving. He's stating a reality here that, yes, you have messed up, yes, things are broken, yes, you are not perfect. But that's why we need grace, and that's why we've always needed grace, that God brings us back, not because we deserve it. He isn't involved in our situations and our struggles, not because we've earned it, because he loves you. And if he loves you, then you have value, and he's always going to pursue you to the end of your days. But then there's another harsh truth. This is all of our righteous, and I will put the word self in brackets here, all of our self-righteous acts, the things that we try to do on our own, trying to live up to the standard of God, the best we try to do are like filthy rags. See, no one ever told me, though, that when I started to study the Hebrew, what this actually meant, what God is saying. See, again, one who was unclean was always on the outside. In the Old Testament, you had the Hebrew people that had women when they were on their menstrual cycles were viewed as unclean. And they were sent outside. They couldn't go to the temple to worship God during that time because they were viewed as unclean. And what kind of things do you think they use to treat themselves? Rags. What God is saying here is your best efforts on your best day that you think are good enough for God are about as useful to Him as a used tampon. Let that sink in. Because it's not about how good you are. It's about how good He is in us. So what that does is it actually releases pressure off us to try and be the best. See, a lot of times we focus on the actions and the behaviors. If only I could do more, if only I could be more. And God says, I want to focus on the character. 
Because if I can change who you are and impact who you are, then everything you do is just going to flow out of that. So stop trying to fix the behavior and give yourself to Christ. And I want to open with a couple of quotes as well. This first one comes from C.S. Lewis. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to a deaf world. Yes, this may be true, because I'll tell you what, from experience, I know that God is most present and prevalent in my life, and he's the most tangible when I'm so broken, or maybe even I've screwed up so much that I need him to be there, and he shows up. I'm like, yes, finally. And that, that, that to me is, is this absolute conundrum that life can be so messy and broken, and a lot of times because I self-destructed, but God is so present regardless. It's this blessing in the midst of chaos. It's this peace in the midst of absolute anarchy. And, and, and yet, that's how he thrives. Because he says, finally, I can have the wheel. And I will be your God. And I will be with you always. Because I love you. But what the scary part is here, he says, those moments, those moments that nobody prays for, God, let me be so broken that I have no choice but to depend on you. Nobody prays for that. Those moments, it says, C.S. Lewis had such wisdom, but it scares me. They're his megaphone to a deaf world. People take note of it. And we feel so broken and even ashamed sometimes because we are broken. God's saying, no, that that is a testimony of my goodness to another person. A person who doesn't even know me, who doesn't believe in me. And I want to clear up one more thing before we really get into it. And I think this, this quote really sums it up better than I do. It's about how we view the scriptures as pertaining to our brokenness and our healing. Jefferson Bethke says this, The Bible is not a rule book. It's a love letter. It's not about my performance. It's about Jesus' performance for me. Grace isn't there for some future me, for some complete me, some whole me. But the real me, the now me, the broken me, the me who struggled, who struggles and is struggling, the me who was messy, is messy and will continue to be messy, the me who was addicted to pornography or other broken addictions and situations in our life, the me who didn't have all the answers, the me who was insecure, he loved me, he loves me in my mess. He was not waiting until I cleaned myself up. He is the one with the mop. He is the one with the surgical gloves and the tools. We do not take a bath we throw ourselves, before we throw ourselves into the shower of love of Christ. We just throw ourselves fully as we are. Why do I say this? Because I know that there's been times in people's lives, I'm speaking for myself, but I'm also a person, where I don't want to even acknowledge something is wrong. I know it's wrong, I know it defines and weighs me down, but it's too much to take in. It's too much to even speak to. And I just want to try and work on it on my own, because maybe it's too painful. And maybe it's overwhelming, and maybe it's crippling, and maybe it's absolutely robbing us of our hope and our joy because it's too much for us to fix, so why would God even care? Or maybe we don't even think about God in that moment. God's saying, no, 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 look, let's go on a healing journey. See, for the next few weeks, it's funny how I was praying about, okay, Lord, what do you want to do? Like, I had this theme of healing, and I thought last week's sermon was it. I'm like, good, dust my hands off, we're good to go. He said, no. And it was funny because I, I love movies, and God speaks to me in movies, and I watched the movie The Shack again, which is one that really speaks to me and one that always breaks me and kind of brings this sense of healing because it forces me to reflect internally and to make choices I need to make and the book has so much impact on people that a lot of times in Christian counseling sessions I say, read the book. It's, it's a story. But if you put yourself as the main character, you can go through what he's going through. It makes you take inventory and make those choices to release yourself, to experience the healing. So I'm going to use that as a bit of a template, but I'm going to go through scripture. So question one that we're going to go through this morning, where is God in a world so filled with unspeakable pain. In other words, why didn't God save me, or help me, or those around me that I care about? 
where was he while this was going on? I think it's a question we all have to ask ourselves at least one point in time in our life. And in order to frame this properly, I'm going to be going through John chapter 11. And again, I thought this was all going to be one week, but I think it's going to be at least three. Starting at the third verse. So the sisters sent word to him, him being Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And I underlined that and I bolded that for one reason, because I think this is, this is a prayer going out from Martha and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus who is sick, to Jesus. But put yourself in this situation. Have you ever said something? And look at the words they use. Behold the one whom you love. Like he needs reminding. Lord, this person that you care about is sick. What they're saying is more implied in what they're not saying. Because if you're taking the time to say, Lord, this person that you care about is sick, they're saying, Lord, if you actually cared, you would do something. If you cared about my pain, you would do something. If you cared about the people in my life, God, you would do something. But let me remind you through the prayers that I present to you. God, if you care about me and the situations I find myself in, in my brokenness and pain, Lord, you say that you love me, and I need to feel that right now. Let me remind you that you love me, that you may step in and do something. We do that out of a fear of insecurity, that, that God may not remember us in the time that we think we need him and act in the way that we think is best for him to act in our lives. And that's okay. It's absolutely okay to be real in your prayers. I encourage it. But I want you to take note of Jesus' response that doesn't go to them. See, they, they get this response of absence, of nothing. And they take it probably as a rejection or just being brushed off that this isn't important enough for God. And I probably speak for everyone here. I know that one point in time in your life, you probably have felt that way as well. Maybe he just doesn't care. Maybe, or this is the biggest lie of all, maybe I deserve this. Maybe my suffering is God's will. Let me remind you of the quote I said last week. God does not architect our pain. He does not invent it. But his purpose is to heal us from it, to not be defined by it, to be liberated from its grasp in our lives. You need to remind yourself of that truth because they prayed this prayer that is the human nature and the thing that we all have done at one point in our lives. God, if you love me, do something. God, if you love this person or the situation, do something. Because in our mind, if he just simply stepped in and fixed it for us, everything would be good. And God would, of course, get the credit, but it would be done now and I would feel better now. But listen to Jesus' response. And again, the people that sent up this prayer, that sent this letter, do not hear it. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. The sickness is not to end in death. That doesn't mean we always get a happy ending. That doesn't mean we're going to get that instant gratification that we're looking for. God, do something right now, please, because I'm really uncomfortable. God says, no, no. I'm going to do something. It's not in your time. Because who doesn't want things fixed now for ourselves, for other people? That, that's that's, that's self-care. That's care for other people. It's not wrong. But just because God doesn't answer in the way we think he does or just because we think he's being silent and we're taking that as a no, it may be, no, my timing is not your timing. My ways are not your ways. Let me do something that is so much beyond what you can even think right now because you're so blinded by your pain and your anguish. I want to do something that is so much better in the wrong run that's going to not only bless you and relieve you of your fears, your pains, your sufferings, I want to do something that blesses so many more people, that is so much bigger, because a lot of people need that hope that they wouldn't have gotten had it not been for your suffering. I want to be that megaphone to a deaf world to see me, to hear me, to know that I care about every person, no matter what it is, no matter what they're going through, not because they deserve it, because they have value, because they are my kids, whether they know it or not. You know, and that's one of the biggest things, I think, that we can actually own that truth. 
Just because he isn't answering the way we think he should doesn't mean no. But it really comes down to a different interaction. See, the thing is, if we don't have... One of my favorite people in the world said this. He said, if you don't have a great sense of humor and a mental grasp on the fact that Jesus loves you and he wants to be with you every second of every moment every day, this world will kill you. And I think that's probably one of the greatest, most simplest truths. See, a lot of times when people look at even the book, The Shack, they have a, this, this instant thing and the people put up these walls and they have this, this, this disassociation from the truths that can come through it and the healing that can come through it and they think, well, that's not God. That's not the God I know and understand. That's okay, but just look at it. The number one thing that people stand up against and people said this to me, I don't believe in that book or believe in that movie because God's not a woman. I say, well, just hold on a second. Like, in the beginning of time, when Adam and Eve were created, it says male and female, he created them in their image, being the image of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Both came from this image of God. Don't tell me he's just male dominant. Jesus came as a man, I'm convinced, because it was a male dominated society. But doesn't mean he doesn't speak to the female parts of our species and our existences. The reason, of course, for the movie presenting God as this motherly figure is because so many people have this fear of their fathers and project their insecurities and their experiences, their relationships, or lack thereof, or unhealthy experiences with their dad onto God. Therefore, there is an arm's length distance that he can get to you. My dad was a, insert word here, Therefore, God's my father, so he must be an even bigger insert word here. You can stay the heck over there. But it's funny that, that, that this book takes a different stance of God having this mothering, nurturing, loving, compassionate embrace and a desire for the son who is lost. Why and where does that come from? Deuteronomy 32.18, Isaiah 42.14, liken God to a mother giving birth to his people. Psalm 131.2 and Isaiah 49.15 and 66.13 compare him to a mother caring for her child or children. Why? Because sometimes I need a mom, not just a dad. I need a God who is so complete and total that no matter what stage in life I'm at, he has the ability to reach me and he will allow me to open myself up to him as he presents himself in the way I need him to. That's who God is. He's saying, I want to come to your life and I will come as you need me. Just allow me to be that man or woman or God or deity in your life in the way that you need. I know it more than you do. Isn't it amazing that every week again with communion that Jesus chose to embrace death. He chose it. To give us the opportunity to choose to embrace life and healing. I mean, that's, that's who God is. You want to know about who God's character is and the way he presents himself. I love you enough that before you knew who I am, and even if you don't choose to know me or want to know me, I'm going to make things easier for you and do for you what you could never do for yourself. And in John chapter 20... It says this, it says that Jesus performed many other signs, wondrous signs, that are not written about in this book. Have you ever wondered about that? Relationship. That's what we're talking about this morning. I want you to run to Christ, just like Marie ran to Bex. with total expectation of acceptance and knowing you're heard and expecting a response. Don't go to God like he's a religious figure. Go to God like he's somebody that you know who knows you and you want to be known by. John 20 again, it says, Jesus performed so many other wondrous signs and miracles in this book, signs and wonders that brought healing and restoration to people's lives. And yet they're not recorded. And it implies because there were so many things done by the resurrected Jesus Christ who chose death for our behalf so we could choose life in his resurrection and he started going to work again, doing what he wants to do to not let people be defined by their brokenness but to heal and restore them in that, to bring them to a new place of living. And it was so, done so much 
as he was physically here for the 40 days he was resurrected, that we could not record them all. That no book, no matter how many words, could record how active Jesus was in the lives of those who came to him. That's who God wants to be in your life today. So again, I'm going to give you a moment to reflect. Have you chosen one thing or thought about one thing you want to be healed from? It's too big, too strenuous, too much. Because God doesn't want to heal us just physically from the little things. He wants to take you beyond your fears, your insecurities. He wants to take you to a place of being forgiven. And here's the scary part, but to forgive other people as well. What does it mean to forgive? We're going to get into that in a couple of weeks. What does it mean to walk this path of healing? It's mine now. Oh, I'm just kidding. You can play with it. (laughs) Pain is sometimes the vehicle that drives us to where we need to be to encounter Christ. If you're riding along and pain is moving you, you think, oh, I really want out of this pain. Lord, heal me of this. What if it's taking its time to get you to a place where you let go? What if God is using this situation that he didn't invent? Okay? He didn't make it. He didn't make your pain. But what if he's using that situation <laughs> to bring you to the place you need to be to encounter him the way you need to encounter him? A lot of times our our motivation is is prayer out of of self-preservation, which is natural, but it's also out of a motivation of, I want to be comfortable. You know, I'd rather be in the place where I'm blessed so I can bless other people and be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ rather than be the one who needs it. And that's fair. But I'll tell you what, the character and life transformation doesn't happen on the mountaintops, it's in the valleys. The, The scriptures aren't lying when these guys who wrote through their suffering times, I am blessed because life sucks. I am blessed because I'm feeling like I'm getting torn apart because God screams in my pain. He's most present in my brokenness, in my inability to fix or answer my own questions or situations. And he shows up and does his thing and I get to walk on down the road because he liberated me from that prison cell I couldn't bust out of. That is going to be this journey if we so choose to let it. So now I get to be vulnerable once again and open up to you what my journey is going to look like. And I was praying about that. I said, there's a few things I could pick, Lord. What what do you want me to pick? What does he want me to, what do you want me to fix from? And God pointed the one thing that I thought I was actually good with. I've mentioned up here many times how I suffered with depression. That I was was so broken and all this type of stuff. I'm not going to go into that. But it's funny that I've, I've been changed so much since those situations. I'm no longer defined by it. But there's still remnants of it in my life. So a few months ago, when, when Bryn was, was really fresh and new, and my mom was out helping us out with her the first few months, um, Melody, my mother, and I were watching this movie called The Star is Born, Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga, and, it, and at the end of it, Bradley Cooper, who had been dealing with all the demons of his past and his alcoholism, he gets clean and sober, but the words of one person that are geared towards destroying him take root in his heart, and he loses his sobriety and ends up killing himself. And you know, it's, it's an emotional part in the movie, but I just, about, I just about threw up. I felt myself just being so overwhelmed, and I thought, what the heck is this? You know, and I had to talk to Melody, and I ended up crying into the night. And it came to me, there's this internal reflection that said, yes, you didn't go down that path, but you have no idea how close you were. And it was this moment of, I, I, that I didn't even know was coming, of God saying, listen, I'm allowing you to experience this, not because it's comfortable, because it wasn't. And I felt so anxious and overwhelmed. I could barely breathe. My heart was pounding. I could barely keep it together. I was almost in this state of absolute anarchy and fear all over again because of a movie. And God said, you need to stop and ask why. And I will tell you. And I did. And he said, because you were this close to being that guy. You were this close to missing out on your firstborn, growing up without a father. You were this close to missing out in an entire lifetime with your secondborn. 
You were this close to actually believing that your absence would bring peace to people's lives. You were this close to damaging so many people's lives around you that you love and care for. And even though you're not there now, I need you to be healed completely from it, not just in a good place here today. You need to take that to the cross and let it go. When I thought I had, but there's been so many situations that have brought this up. And again, I'm not there, so don't don't think that I'm there, because I'm not, but there's still remnants there that when I'm sad or having a bad day, I have a fear of, well, what if I slip back into depression? God says, no, that fear needs to be gone. God says, no, that opportunity, that option needs to be gone. I'm glad I've taken you here, but I need to take you to the promised land. I need to take you beyond the borders of your Egypt. I need to take you out of that slavery into absolute liberation. You've crossed the river. You need to cross the desert. And when you cross the desert, you need to cross that border. You need to claim the place I'm giving you in your life for you because I want to heal you, not just temporarily give you reprieve. Do not settle for the moments of peace. Settle for healing in Jesus Christ. That's my journey over the next few weeks. What is yours? See, over the last few weeks, last, after last Sunday, I get home. And I posted on our Facebook, and a lot of you know this, there's this another pastor, another pastor, 30 years old, three years younger than me, killed himself because he was so overwhelmed with life and left behind his kids, his wife, and his church hurting. This is not a reality that doesn't take place in the walls of the body of Christ. But this is a reality that needs to be addressed, needs to be healed from. I don't know what it is for you, but that for me was enough to say, okay, Let's go through it. This week I posted something that was a memory as well from someone else's words from last year at this time when things were a little bit rougher for me. And I keep posting it every year because it seems to be speaking to people's existences and I quote it and it has to do with actually framing what depression feels like with the words that somebody else gave and I just copy and paste it because it actually speaks to me. It spoke to me in my situation and it spoke to a lot of people that I posted and talked to about it. So this thing kept coming up. It kept reminding me of situations. Another friend of Melody's that, was, that she knew had committed suicide and it just became so real and struck home that it, this is happening far too much. And, and God was saying, so what are you going to do? All these reminders and the timing of it just kept pointing to this one thing. Do you want to be healed? Or do you want to settle for the temporary reprieve? Let me take you on the journey. Know who I am. I'm the God who loves you. And even though you're praying things and you want it done in your way because you think that would be so best for you and your situation and maybe I'm not responding the way you think, know that I'm here to not let your sickness end in death. I'm not here to let your situation be the end of you. I am the God of resurrection and new life. I am the resurrection and the new life. One of the things I'm going to talk about Maybe down the road, I'm just going to totally give away the whole punchline now because it hit me. You know, you've got in Scripture, Elijah and Elisha. And I've talked about Elijah and how he suffered with depression, which is great that the Scriptures are honest with human narrative and experience. And he finally gets to the pinnacle of his existence when he meets Elisha. And Elijah's getting ready to go home. His work is done. And Elisha says, no, no, I I need something from you. I want twice as much blessing coming to me than I deserve. I want grace, is what he's saying. And Elijah says, well, I'll ask God for you because I can't do that. And God says, sure, why not? Wise thing to ask for. Did you know that Elijah, give or take, did about eight major miracles in the scriptures? Did you know that when Elisha said, I want twofold, he did 15 major miracles? Miracles in his lifetime. And the last situation, he finds himself before the king and he says, take these arrows and as many arrows you fire, many victories and blessings that are going to come upon you and your nation. And he fires one, two, three, and he stops and Elijah says, he gets mad and he rips him a new one. What the insert word here are you doing? You've limited God's ability in your life. You've limited his blessing and his ability to work in your life. You said three when it could have been 3,000, 3 million. Don't stop. Let God be God. And then he died. So, I mean, that, that, that's something that's huge. So not only was he speaking something that speaks in our lives, but he spoke to this king, and then he died at 15 when it should have been 16. But it says, 
God was not finished with him, even in death. There was this child who had died, and they said, bring him to the grave and lay him on the bones of Elisha because God was so powerful in his life, he resurrected new life even though he was dead and had nothing to do with Elisha. It fulfilled the promise of God that sickness does not end in death, that death does not define who we are, that it's in his life, his healing for our lives in Jesus' name. Let me please hear an amen. amen. God, take us on this place, this journey of healing, Lord. Let it be real. Lord, I don't just want it to be nice words I speak at the pulpit. Lord, take us on a journey that is uncomfortable, that is absolutely overwhelming, that we can't even do it on our own, Lord. But I pray for absolute reprieve in the meantime and absolute total healing in the long run because you are God, the God of the living, of life-giving, of healing, of life-resurrecting, of absolute change. Lord, even when it feels like we're being dragged to the graveyard and laid on other bones, Bring new life. Lord, and when we cry out, if only you loved me, and if I just remind you in the right words, in the right way, you'll do things that I need done. God says, I have bigger and better things in store for you, but it won't be easy. There will be pain. Not because I'm architecting it, because that's just the way it is, but I will bring you through it and deliver you from it because I love you. Amen. Thank you, Lord.